Thanks, Ken. Uh, okay, over to you. Thanks a lot. Thanks, Ken. That's brilliant. Um, and thanks very much for inviting me along tonight. Um, just to check, uh, you can see the slides okay and you can hear me okay? Yes. Yes, that's working well. Good stuff. Thank you very much. Um, so, hi, everybody, and thanks for, thanks for coming along tonight um, to, to, to listen to me talk around uh, some of the work that Network Bill um, has been doing around uh, decarbonisation and specifically around fracking decarbonisation um, over the past couple of years uh, alongside the industry. Um, so today, the, the presentation is entitled um, Today, Tomorrow and the Future. So I'm, I'm just going to talk through some of the key things um, and on the various different time horizons that we've been looking at recently um, around traction decarb and kind of the, the key uh, topics that the, the industry is trying to, trying to deal with and trying to face and kind of some of the key stuff that we're um, dealing with to kind of uh, remove uh, carbon emissions from, from the rail network in, in general. Um, so I'll start with a, a little bit of an introduction uh, in sort of embellishing what Ben's just said there. So, um, so I'm Stephen Hart, a uh, lead strategic planner uh, within Network Rail System Operator Freight and Network Strategy Team. Um, so me and my team um, principally look after the long-term strategic planning activities for the rail freight industry. Um, so we do um, kind of long-term planning for, for, for rail freight, um, understanding what needs to be done for the network and, and kind of when it needs to be done with long-term rate growth. Um, we also, uh, as a team, also cover strategic planning activities, which involve more than uh, three or more of Network Rail's regional teams. Um, so each of the regional teams in Network Rail has their own strategic planning function that deal with geographically specific items. Um, but, uh, and where there's kind of overlap between two regions, they just interface with each other. Um, but where there's three or more regions impacted by a piece of strategic planning, me and my team look after that. Um, and one of the major pieces of work that we've been doing over the past couple of years is, is traction decarbonisation network strategy, which I'm going to talk, talk to you a little bit about. Um, this evening. Um, so as well as the, the work that we've been doing on the Traction Decarb Network Strategy, I'm going to talk a little bit around um, some of the, the wider aspects of traction decarbonisation and a little bit further around the subject, um, as well as providing some context for, for the need for emission reduction and, and kind of what role rail plays in, in emissions in the UK in general at the minute. Um, the principal uh, body of the talk that I'll be giving tonight was going to focus around three key areas for the industry. So today, um, what can we be doing right now to reduce emissions in transport as, as a whole? Tomorrow, what things can we do with kind of relatively small um, levels of public investment and kind of relatively short timescales um, to improve and reduce the emissions that we have on the railway today? And then the future, so what is the long-term plan and kind of where do we we need to get to and, and what's the time horizons associated with that um, so that we can ultimately end rails contribution to, to greenhouse gas emissions on the network. So decarbonisation, um, it's obviously a big thing and, and it's a very topical, topical item, lots of, um, lots of uh, news stories, especially with COP26 just concluding. Um, but ultimately this comes from uh, the, the kind of needs and urgency and, and um, the, the kind of real impetus and drive to, to move towards decarbonisation um, began in earnest in, in strength in 2015 at a previous COP um, when the world's leaders came together and collectively agreed to um, limit global average temperature rise to well below 2 degrees C with an ambition to limit the rise to below 1.5 degrees C. And that's been subsequently reaffirmed at, at subsequent COPs, including in COP26 last week. The main reason for, for those two temperature ranges um, and the ambition to reduce to um, below 1.5 um, is effectively that at 1.5, the, the kind of risks associated with various different aspects of, of the global weather system. Um, 
start to change and, and start to change in a significant way that, that causes significant impact and causes key risk and, and potential loss to human life, um, as well as kind of significant impacts such as loss of sea ice, um, increase in severe weather events, and, and we're already seeing that today um, through, through the, the kind of temperature rises that we've seen already. Um, we're seeing significant increases in, in severe weather events uh, across the globe, including in the UK and Europe. Um, increases in heat waves and crop loss and, and kind of shifts in rainfall, rainfall pattern. So as we've said um, last week, obviously the world's leaders came together again for, for COP26 and in Glasgow. Um, and um, there, there was lots of uh, good discussion there and, and, and a number of, kind of uh, key messages reinforced um, with a, a number of new commitments made from, from countries from around the world. To, to kind of support and back up the work that's been done since 2015. So just painting a little bit of a picture from a, a UK perspective. Um, so this graph here shows the, the UK's um, annual uh, CO2e emissions uh, since the 1990s. Um, for the various different sectors within uh, within the UK economy from a, a greenhouse gas emission reporting perspective. Um, so railway is, the railway is included as part of surface transport. Um, as you can see, surface transport, which is the kind of darkish blue line in the middle of the graph there, has remained fairly constant since 1990. Um, there hasn't been a uh, a significant increase or a significant decrease kind of remained broadly consistent. Um, that's principally because um, whilst vehicles have been, have been becoming cleaner throughout that time from both a road and rail perspective, um, the uh, number of vehicles, most notably road vehicles, has increased significantly. So any kind of um, uh, uh, reduction in, in, in emissions from improved efficiency has been offset by the fact that the number of vehicles themselves has, has increased significantly. Um, and that's led to a, a reasonably broadly neutral position. With a significant focus over the last couple of years from um, uh, especially in the last 10 years um, within the power and industry sectors, um, especially around uh, electricity generation. Um, especially around electricity generation, um, the um, our uh, sector has, has obviously significantly reduced with the kind of closure of, of the uh, coal power or five power plants within the UK. Um, and obviously they're being uh, progressively phased out for the, the levels of coal fired power, coal, power, fire, yeah, coal fired power plants um, has uh, seen a significant decrease in, in our emissions from um, electricity generation. And similarly, industry has, has equally kind of seen a significant as a result of um, cleaner and greener um, electricity consumption, as well as kind of reduction in, in a number of different uh, areas and, and the use of kind of on site uh, generation, power generation for a number of things in industry. Um, so, as you can see, as a result of that, as we stand today, um, surface transport is the highest emitting sector um, within all of the UK economy. So what does that mean uh, for, so how does how does rail fit into that and, and how does rail, what part does rail play in that, that blue line that we saw on, on the previous graph? So out of that blue line that we saw, um, around about 77% of those emissions come from cars and other small road vehicles, so kind of vans and um, uh, motorbikes and, and various other things. Um, around 3% comes from, from buses and, and coaches. Um, and around 18% come from heavy goods vehicle, um, so moving goods uh, around the country. Um, so that leaves 2% for, for rail. So, so rail contributes around about 2% of the uh, total surface transport emission um, from, from uh, in the UK as a whole. Um, so as a result, and as you can see, rail is relatively a, a, a very good and very green mode of transport already, even though we have, um, even though we, we have diesel trains in the network, um, we still comparatively provide a, a very, very small overall contribution to the surface transport emissions and, and indeed the UK's uh, green transport emissions. As a whole. Um, 
so as a result of that, and I think one of the key things that, that um, I, I, I'd, I'd like to stress and, and like to emphasise to people is that, that rail is a, a fantastic way to decarbonise transport as a whole with the vast majority of emissions coming from, from uh, cars and, and from HGVs, and um, the opportunity to modal shift people and goods to, to, um, to the rail network is, is significant. And we can really um, significantly drive a, 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 an emission reduction through the surface transport sector as a whole, if we can achieve sustainable modal shift um, from road uh, uh, onto rail basically. And that is very much what the focus of, of kind of supporting decarb today is. Um, so the modal shift of road to rail using, even using a diesel locomotive um, removes up to 76 HGVs from the road um, with significant opportunities to reduce logistics emission um, with a greater modal share um, for rail. Uh, modal shift of people is uh, still net carbon positive. So, so there is still good emissions reduction by modal shifting people um, from cars onto the rail network um, but obviously that picture will change over time as cars move to, to zero emission vehicles. Um, the challenge for, for freight is, is less certain and, and rail is likely to carry its green credentials for freight significantly further in the future on the basis that there is um, very little in the way of kind of zero emissions vehicles for, for HGVs, especially um, heavy haul HGVs um, with a number of technologies in, in kind of very early emerging stages, but certainly it appears that nothing will be widely commercially available until at least the kind of late 2030s, early 2040s, um, where there'll be a significant uh, commercial drive to, to shift for HGVs. Supporting decarbonisation tomorrow. Um, so the emphasis here is, is focusing on how we can utilise the, the network that we have today in a much better way. How can we remove and reduce the amount of diesel operation and the electrified infrastructure that we have on the network? And how can we provide a, a number of kind of extensions to the electrified network to be able to, to reduce and remove significant volume of diesel haulage that especially within the freight sector um that um that, that exists because a number of freight terminals are kind of the last 10 15 miles um from the electrified network to the terminal aren't electrified personally as well as that um we need to ensure that we're focusing on investing in diesel technology itself as well and making sure that we're making diesel cleaner through the use of um, battery diesel hybridization, as well as bi-mode trains, uh, electric diesel bi-mode trains, which can use the, the um, midline infrastructure where it's available. Um, but for those parts of the network where that isn't provided yet, can run off diesel um, able to, to be able to optimize and, and really utilize that existing electrified network, um, as well as things and, and technologies such as um, part stop technology, um, HVO, biofuel, and a number of other aspects that I'll, I'll talk about in a little bit more detail. Um, when we go through that. Then finally, supporting decarb in the future. Um, from a long-term perspective, we need an extensive electrification program of the rail network to be able to allow um, fully electric trains and locomotives to move people and freight around our network in a zero carbon way. Um, we will also need um, battery and hydrogen rolling stock um, in certain areas of the network. Um, as we'll see as I go through the presentation, um, the economic electrification um, don't stack up in, in certain areas of the network. And, and for those areas, we will absolutely need kind of battery and hydrogen, um, and they will absolutely have a, have a role to play in supporting the, the transition to, to a zero carbon rail network. In the very short term, as I've said, the utilisation of assets is, is going to be key and making sure that we're making you the best use and, and reducing the emissions of the assets that we have today as far as is reasonably possible. Um, the amount of electrification, as we'll see, um, that's required is going to be significant and we need to start that electrification programme now if we're going to stand any chance of, of heading towards and achieving the 2050 targets. Um, but equally, that electrification is not going to be delivered it all the night and we need to try and make it sure that we're utilizing the assets that we have in the most way possible and reduce the emissions as much as we can in the short to medium term as well. So from a, a, a now perspective, 
Um, the modal shift question is always a really interesting one. Um, rail is currently the only viable surface transport mode for, for transporting both people and heavy goods in a zero carbon way. Um, as I said, that's likely to remain the case for heavy goods for the foreseeable future, um, with the roll haulage industry facing pretty much exactly the same problems that we face in rail for decarbonisation of heavy goods vehicles, which is that you need an awful lot of power and the alternatives that exist away from diesel fuel just don't have the, the ability to provide sufficient volumes of power in a sustainable way that can mean that you can still operate the network as it operates today. Um, so that's exactly the same problem we face in rail um they're facing on the roads as well and, and there's a, a a big challenge around kind of battery hydrogen and and um direct wire electrification of, of the road network to understand what the most optimum solution is i think it's really important when people talk about modal shift people have this tendency and, and propensity to to describe things like road versus rail or air versus rail or air versus road or whatever it is definitely not a versus thing um, we need to move away as, a, as an economy uh, we need to move away from this competitive sort of approach that we appear to have where we we see kind of road competing with rail for various different things road can do stuff that rail can't do rail can do stuff that road can't do what we absolutely need to do is we need to make sure that we're using the right mode of transport for the right movement rail can't do everything i can't get my amazon package delivered to my front door by a train because i haven't got a railway line that goes up to my front door but i can equally get a package uh, my amazon package could be moved from Scotland to London um, with relative ease on train and then the last sort of 10, 15, 20 miles, whatever, um, delivered by an e-van or a, a cargo bike or whatever. So it's really important that we're, we're seeing the logistics sector especially and, and the transport sector as a whole as kind of making sure that we're using the right mode of transport for the right movements of, of whatever it is that we're moving and that that move away from from an adversarial approach is going to be absolutely essential um, if we're going to decarbonize the economy as a whole so what i'm going to do now is talk about road versus rail <laughs> um so, so I, I just said that I'm not going to do that and I don't like doing that, but I am going to show you some stats about road versus rail um, just to uh, just to give you a bit of a flavour of, um, of, of kind of what the, the comparisons are between road and rail. I appreciate this slide is is, is slightly complex and, and there's an awful lot of information to, to absorb on it, but um, I, I thought I'd provide um, some interesting detail and, and some numbers uh, just to support kind of the conversation and, and ensure the level of benefits that exist. Um, so based on um, current statistics, I stress this is current statistics and, and uh, obviously this will change over time as, as the road the, the, the road fleet uh, decarbonizes and becomes zero emissions um, over time. So this, this doesn't stack up into the future, um, but it, this is as it stands today. Um, you can see that to compete with a, a car, um, a, a diesel train has to have uh, around about nine to 15 people um, per vehicle. So I, I stress per vehicle, that's not per train, that's per vehicle on a train. Um, it has to have nine to 15 people in each vehicle to, to be able to kind of compete with car, car basically. Um, for electric, uh, based on the existing electrical grid mix that we have in the UK, um, that drops to around four to six people. Um, to be able to, to effectively be the car, basically. On average, um, pre-COVID uh, passenger vehicle loadings were at around about 22 passengers per vehicle. Um, obviously, um, COVID has had an impact on, on kind of the number of passengers that are on the network, but that is beginning to recover now. And we are now back at, at over 70% of passengers back on the network on, on a regular basis. Now. Um, for freight, as I mentioned earlier on, um, Freight uh, offers a significant benefit um, for, for roll haulage um, with a, a single freight train moving up to 76 HGVs from the road. Um, the potential, even using a, a diesel locomotive, um, it is, is significant. The, the, the benefits are significant from, from doing that, and, and the amount of uh, carbon that's removed from the system is poor um, through uh, being able to, to utilize the, the power capabilities of a single diesel locomotive. 
um, is, is significant, as you can see there. So I talked a, a little earlier on around what we can do, what we can do in the, the kind of medium term, and, and we absolutely need to make better use of, of what we have. Uh, the, the rail industry as a whole um, has, a, has a number of areas where we, we don't necessarily utilise and, and leverage and, and, and utilise the assets that we have in, in the most optimal way in order to, to reduce emissions as, as a whole. And um, one of the prime statistics that, that we came out with as, as in developing traction decarb network strategy is that around about 30% of the UK's uh, traction rail emission come from diesel trains that operate underneath electrified infrastructure. So by being able to, to, to move those electric, tra uh, move those diesel trains away from using diesel where there is electric uh, electrification available that could reduce um traction emissions by 30 percent by itself so we don't have to actually do anything uh, anywhere we, we literally can just swap swap some trains out and we can reduce emissions significantly and um, equally there, there are a number of major ports um and, and a number of areas on the, the passenger network where we can provide some small levels of electrification um in some areas and that would allow services which operate as diesel today have to have the potential to switch to direct electric traction. And um, most notably, that includes the likes of um, Felixstowe um, in Suffolk, London Gateway in, in um, on River Thames, um, Park in, in Manchester, um, as well as connecting the likes of Tees Port um, uh, in in the northeast on onto the east coast mainline as well, and a number of the terminals are in in Birmingham at uh, Hams Ball and, and Lawley Street, um, onto the west coast mainline. Um, connecting those ports and terminals um, in the existing electrified network, uh, electrified infrastructure, um, will uh, could allow a, a significant shift and, and a significant transition away from using um, diesel freight locomotives to straight electric locomotives and that would help us to reduce our emissions um, significantly um, through delivery of, of what is a, a kind of very small handful of single track kilometers of electrification. We also need to, to make sure that in the kind of short to medium term we're, we're optimizing and utilizing the, the best kind of vehicles that we can. Um, so we've seen the introduction on, on some of the long distance high speed services of, of the class 8 OX units from Hitachi um, with bi-mode capability, diesel electric bi-mode capability on those um, so that they can utilize the electrified where it exists and, and then run as diesel um, where the wires haven't been put up yet. Um, equally, there are a number of proposals coming forward from, from um, the rolling stock owning companies for, for hybridizing vehicles. Um, so both Angel and Port Brook have, have recently proposed um, battery diesel hybridization on the um, on some of their vehicles uh, in in Across the, across the network and the 16X and 17X fleets. Um, and uh, just last week, um, Borbrook and Schultz, uh, in conjunction with Hitachi, announced that they'd be swapping out um, some of the diesel gen sets on the Class A or tubes um, on uh, Great Western and Trans Pennine. Um, uh, so one of the uh, diesel gen sets has been taken out of those trains and swapped for the battery gen set to allow a more optimum. Uh, fuel utilization through, through using uh, sort of hybrid battery traction when the train's operating in diesel mode. Um, as well as that, um, we've begun to, to, to deploy biofuels um, within the rail network today. Um, so we've had a number of successful freight uh, operations using hydrogenated vegetable oil fuels, um, which where it can be sustainably sourced um, can utilize the existing uh, diesel traction assets that we have today in a more efficient way and, and significantly reduce the volume of, uh, of uh, not just CO2, um, but also um, uh, uh, NOx and uh, particulate matter um, from an air quality perspective as well, and in through uh, kind of general emissions from, from the freight trains that we operate on the network. And a number of the rail freight operators across the UK are beginning to, to offer HVO fuel uh, to their customers on a, on a kind of regular basis. And there are a number of customers using the rail freight network um, who are actively um, kind of transitioning and, and willing to pay a slight premium 
um, to operate using HBO fuel. So we're beginning to see that rolled out on a, on a more consistent basis um, across the network, and that will definitely help to reduce uh, emissions from diesel freight trains. Um, I will sit here and say this is absolutely not the long-term solution. Um, diesel is definitely not the long-term solution, but we have to be cognizant that um, the kind of longer-term program of traction decarb that I'm going to talk about in, in the next few slides is going to take time to implement. And things like the utilization of HVO and, and hybridization and cleaning up diesel today can realize emissions reductions today. Um, and as uh, as as, as uh, one of my erstwhile colleagues in, in the Rail Industry Association regularly says a, a tonne of carbon saved today is 29 tonnes by 2050. Um, so we have to um, we have to be, be cognizant that uh, what what we can save today um, it is definitely beneficial and, and, and we should be aiming and striving to save as and optimize the assets that we have in front of us. And we have to uh, move away from uh, constantly kind of vilifying and, and, and just betraying diesel as a as an evil entity. Um, it, it needs to be seen as, as something that can help us if we uh, deploy it in an optimal way and, and clean it up as much as we can. It can be used as an excellent transitional technology and we can get to a, a, a successful end. So enough of me talking about modal shift and, and, and diesel. Um, I, I'm, I'm going to talk about the, the rosy picture of the future now and, and talk around um, kind of what, what it is that we should be striving towards achieving and um, how we can get there. Um, so in response to, to, to a number of uh, pieces of research that have been done within the rail industry and ultimately in response to, to the then um, transport minister at the time, uh, a rail minister at the time, uh, George Johnson, um, in 2018's aspiration to remove all diesel only trains from the network by 2040, um, decarbonisation was ultimately established and it was established to kind of uh, explore the requirements for rail in, in a decarbonised future and, and understand what technology should be deployed where. Um, it was specifically cast at looking at, at where we should deploy battery, electric and hydrogen uh, trains, which were the three technologies that were deemed sufficiently mature enough to be able to be readily deployed into the, into the rail network um, as it stands um, in order to remove diesel trains from operation. Um, in order to, to kind of do that piece of work and, and provide something that was meaningful and credible, um, we uh, developed a, a programme business case in line with the HM Treasury approved five case business case model to be able to, to kind of look at the various different aspects of, of implementing uh, what we were proposing, not just from a kind of strategic and, and recommendations perspective, but what that meant from a kind of economic and, and financial perspective as well as exploring how we go about kind of doing it and um, buying it and, and kind of managing such a program. Um, TDNS has been used uh, since, since it was uh, completed in October last year. Um, it has been used uh, as the primary input for the Department of Transport's uh, Transport Decarbonisation Plan and the Rail Environmental Policy Statement, um, both of which, um, and subsequently the, the net zero uh, strategy that the government released a few weeks ago, um, all of which have outlined a commitment to a long term cost efficient and sustainable programme of electrification. Um, and that has principally been as a result of the work that we did as part of Traction Decarb Network Strategy. And um, so the Network Rail Regional Teams, and, and um, as was outlined recently, it's William Schaff's plan for rail, the, the newly formed um, Great British Railways that, that will take over uh, ownership and management of the rail network um, from around 2023, um, are, are building on the work and, and kind of enhancing the work that we did as part of Traction Decard Network Strategy, and they're using that to feed into the wider rail industry's 30-year strategic plan, um, which is called the Whole Industry Strategic Plan. Um, so TDNS and, and, and the approach that we used as part of the programme business case was, was very much uh, placed and, and developed to allow project, individual projects and programmes that need to be delivered as, as part of the, the kind of wider programme to have an overarching strategic reference document to be able to point towards. 
so that they could demonstrate how their kind of small project or program contributed to the wider um, industry, a wider network achieving an end goal. Um, that will be especially key for, for those projects that don't necessarily have the strongest economic cases. So for those projects that, that need to, to be delivered in order to achieve traction decarb, um, that don't have a very good economic case, they can point to an overarching document that does have a good economic case to say, my project is playing one very small, plays a very small part in this much bigger thing that has a much better um, sort of economic rationale for, for undertaking it. And it allows them to be able to, to point towards that as a, as a credible reference, uh, reference point. As well as that, there is a significant volume of industry planning going on at the minute, whether that be for CP7 or, or CP8, as we move into our next uh, five-year funding periods beyond 2024, um, but also um, for, for kind of the, the industry as a whole in, in kind of manufacturing, um, rolling stock, understanding where to invest money and, and understanding which products to bring forward and when to bring them forward. TDNS can provide a, a good kind of stable basis to, to make sound financial investments from a private sector perspective. As well as that, with the introduction of um, the William Shapps Plan for Rail and the transition towards passenger service contracts, um, the, the work that we've done will in, help to inform the future passenger service contract specification um, so that any uh, future operators of the network can be aware of kind of what the network's going to look like um, as, they, um, as they move um, as they take over operations and, and manage those operations over a longer basis. So the strategic case and, and, and the strategic rationale for traction decarbonisation in, in general is, is uh, can be covered in, in six key things. Obviously, and, and kind of most importantly, the, the kind of principal aim of, of what we're doing here is emissions reduction and, and trying to reduce emissions uh, in the longer term, but also um, achieve and, and kind of optimise short term emissions reductions as well. But there are a number of other benefits that come along with um, with, with traction decarbonisation and, and it's critical that we, we kind of cover those off and, and, and focus on those aside from the emissions reduction as well, because that only plays one very small, well, it plays a significant part, but it only plays one part of a, a kind of much bigger portfolio of, of benefits that you get. Um, there are a number of opportunities through um, kind of incentivization um, that utilize the network as a green solution to, to instigate and increase modal shift and the benefits that come with modal shift, as well as the opportunity to, to offer for, for battery and hydrogen um, economies of scale through multimodal recharging and refueling hubs. And that will be especially true for, for hydrogen and, and utilization of hydrogen fuel across a number of different sectors may benefit from. Um, rail being an, an anchor client within a, a refueling. The decarbonisation of traction in general and, and move away from diesel trains um, allows faster trains to be provided and increased capacity for freight without having to actually increase capacity on the network because an electric freight train can haul um, uh, longer, load, longer and heavier loads at, at a faster speed um, than diesel uh, trains so can keep uh, can more capacity basically in the same path as a diesel train does um, as well as that um, the move away from diesel traction increases and, and improves reliability through the reduction of, of moving parts um, and uh, electric traction is as, as significantly simplifi uh, simplified um, and as a result um, improves overall reliability. As well as that, non-diesel traction provides a, a, an overall OPEX cost saving, so we, we have a direct cost saving um, through not having to, to kind of do as much maintenance or provide as much fuel or uh, various other different bits and pieces, as well as um, electric trains providing reductions in access charges um, as a result of um, the trains being significantly lighter, they do less damage to the network. And as a result, Network Rail doesn't charge the operators um, as much money because we don't need to do as much intervention on our on our network. So the track access charges that we charge operators are reduced where, where we provide electric trains. Whilst electrification and, and, and decarbonisation of traction in general is, is not um, likely to fix the air quality problem in 
time scales that it needs to be fixed um because the air quality problem needs to be fixed on on much shorter time scales than, than we're talking around here um the decarbonization of traction does provide a long um credible solution for air quality um and that will be essential in kind of understanding what things need to be done in the very short term to be able to fix air quality in, in various different areas. As well as that, the move away from diesel traction for, for uh, rail freight um, will likely improve and, and increase the ability and viability of, of a number of uh, potential freight operating tracks um, around the country um, as a number of uh, freight sites are, are currently restricted or, or limited in terms of growth and further development on the basis of kind of air quality uh, emissions that come from those sites today. As well as that, there are a number of other wider economic benefits as well. Um, with the vast majority of the unelectrified network being away from London and the South East, there's a significant opportunity to increase um, uh, jobs, um, for both infrastructure and rolling stock um, away from that area. And that aligns heavily with the, the wider government levelling up agenda, um, as well as the potential opportunity to, to have rail uh, be used as a, a kind of first in class um, technology deployment for, for hydrogen traction. Um, and that could subsequently benefit and, and support a number of different um, uh, sectors of the economy, um, which may use hydrogen at, at a later stage in, in, uh, as we transition to, to a kind of a future decarbonized state in general. So given the, the kind of relatively small emissions footprint for rail, um, kind of why do we need to do something now? And why, 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 why do we need to decarbonize traction now? Um, I, I think, as I've said, on several slides now, kind of rail is a is, is an excellent uh, sort of mode of transport to support decarbonisation of surface transport as a whole through modal shift, and that's especially true for freight. Um, but equally, other sectors of the economy, such as, as aviation and agriculture, um, are going to struggle to achieve a, a zero emissions footprint, and as such, will likely continue to 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 emit beyond 2050. Um, uh, we've been informed by government that a national approach is going to be taken to offsetting any residual emissions post 2050 but there's currently a significant volume of uncertainty around kind of the emissions that can be sequestered post 2050 um, and as a result the complex sectors such as aviation and agriculture are likely to take up most if not all of the any sequestration budget that will exist um, post 2050. Um, so that's going to mean pretty much everybody else in the economy is going to have to achieve zero or certainly virtually zero emissions um, by 2050 if we're to achieve net zero 2050 as a, as a whole economy. For the railway, um, that requires traction decarbonisation and, and that requires a significant volume of uh, infrastructure and rolling stock and that requires kind of a long term plan and, uh, to, and kind of developing and delivering significant volumes of, of uh, infrastructure and rolling stock kind of can't just be done overnight we can't decide in 2049 that we want to decarbonize the rail network because we, we just wouldn't have the time to be able to do that so we need to have kind of a, a credible long-term plan in place to be able to start implementing that now so that we can achieve and, and hit kind of the, the the position for 2050. As well as that, um, as I mentioned earlier on, um, battery and hydrogen are, are going to be key and, and play a key role. Um, we currently have uh, a very limited amounts of kind of battery and hydrogen uh, trains within the UK, um, although uh, both the solutions for both do exist um, in, in, in kind of a credible trial state. Um, we need to begin to, to introduce those into wider operational deployment um, if we're to kind of successfully embed and, and uh, understand the kind of operational implications of those technologies and make sure that we're embedding that kind of lessons learned into future deployments of battery and hydrogen as they're rolled out on a much wider scale. So moving more to TDNS and, and kind of what we did, um, uh, essentially traction decarbonisation network strategy used the previous technical capability works that had been done um, by the RSSB and, and the wider industry and effectively determined kind of 
which technology should be deployed where around the capability of those technologies. Um, so as you can see on the, on the chart on the, the top left there, um, for passenger services that operate over 100 mile an hour, so up to 125 mile an hour, and for freight services, the only credible um, technology is electrification. And that's because um, the power requirements needed to operate over 100 mile an hour are significant. And for freight, they pull heavy, uh, heavy and significant loads up to 4,800 tons. That needs an awful lot of power. And the only way that you can credibly deliver that power is through directly providing a, a electricity, um, given that battery and hydrogen have kind of relatively poor energy densities. Um, they're, they're kind of not capable of operating those services in a, in a credible uh, operating way that is kind of commercially viable for freight. Um, so that kind of leads us to, to the diagram on, on the right hand side of the screen, um, where you, so areas of the network where you have high freight volumes or where you have uh, operations that are over 100 miles an hour, the only, the only solution that you essentially have is, is to deploy electrification basically, it's, it's the only choice you have. Um, equally for areas of the network which kind of have a significantly reduced usage, because electrification Real electrification is relatively expensive. Um, it's not, not going to stack up economically to electrify those parts of the network that only have kind of one train every two hours or something like that. Um, so based on the, the kind of current technological capabilities of, of uh, battery and hydrogen, so a battery train can do around about 100 kilometers before it needs recharging. Um, a hydrogen can do up to around about 2000 kilometers at the moment. So essentially 100 kilometers is, is kind of cut off point basically. Anything under 100 kilometers you can probably manage with a battery train. Anything over you would have to deploy a hydrogen train. Then we're kind of leave, left with this bit in the middle, basically, um, where there's kind of, th there isn't necessarily a technological need to deploy a specific technology over another, um, but actually for, for other reasons you might want to, whether that be kind of operational or, or economic, um, you may want to deploy kind of one technology over another. Um, so we kind of call that the, the middle ground or kind of multiple options, basically. Of the um, unelectrified rail network in, 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 on the GB network, we have around about 15 and a half thousand single track kilometers of, electric, uh, of unelectrified network. Um, so that, that's kind of 15 and a half thousand um, single track kilometers to kind of decide what you need to do with it. Um, based on the analysis that we did, um, we allocate just over 11 and a half thousand of those to, to electrification on the basis of their use for, for freight and for long distance high speed services. Um, there was operation of over just over 400 uh, SDKs uh, for battery and over 900 SDKs for, for hydrogen. And then there was around, uh, there was about two and a half thousand track kilometers where they were wasn't a clear technical choice to deploy. Um, we did some operational and economic analysis of that two and a half thousand single track kilometers and then further allocated around about another 1300 to electrification an additional 400 to both battery and hydrogen. And we were essentially left out of 15 and a half thousand single track kilometers with 260 single track kilometers where we didn't make a recommendation as part of TDS because we just didn't know what the answer would be. Um, as part of the work that we did, and, and that's publicly available on Network Rail's website, we, we published a map basically. So the map on, on the right hand side that the, shows the UK, uh, GB rail network, and um, the black lines are the already electrified infrastructure. Um, anything that's green is where we've proposed electrification, blue is hydrogen and, and yellow is battery. Um, as well as the, the recommendations that you can see there, um, we also made a number of other recommendations aside from kind of which technology to deploy where. That included uh, making sure that any new railways that are built um, in East West Rail um, should consider the need to kind of operate using zero carbon rolling stock. Um, that's not necessarily to say that it should operate using zero carbon rolling stock from day one, um, especially with the number of the kind of restoring your railway scheme and stuff like that. It, it's perhaps unfair to burden a small scheme like that that's trying to kind of bring small benefits to a, a local community with a kind of major electrification program. Um, so it, it's not necessarily fair to kind of say that there should be zero carbon from day one 
but they certainly should be thinking about how they would operate as, as part of the zero carbon. As I mentioned earlier on, we need to begin to um, introduce battery and hydrogen trains into operation to ensure that kind of um, standards and best practices is, is deployed and we're gaining and learning whole system operational experience so that when we uh, deploy further battery and hydrogen trains in the future, we kind of know what we're doing basically. And um, we've got a good idea of kind of what the good stuff and what the bad stuff is so that we can start to kind of design, it, uh, design out kind of any of the kind of major problems that we might face in those early deployments. As I mentioned earlier on, we we kind of we will need diesel and, and we will definitely need diesel to, to support us to, to a transition to, to a zero carbon future. Um, we can't afford to vilify it and paint it as an evil proposition, but we definitely do need to clean it up through the use of kind of hybridization and, and buy more trains, um, as well as the opportunities to use kind of biofuels and, and through the kind of use of HVO. Um, and all the other sort of uh, emissions efficiency technology. Um, that being said, we probably shouldn't be buying any diesel only trains anymore, um, unless there's a really, really good reason to do that. Um, and I suspect that from a financing perspective, you, you will struggle, uh, anybody will struggle to find a, a rolling stock owning company that will be able to secure finance for, for a diesel only train now. Um, which is why we're seeing a lot of the trains that are being introduced that are, are kind of diesel electric buy modes or certainly diesel battery hybrids um, to be able to kind of uh, have that transition in uh, um, kind of a future state where the network is, is not kind of using diesel basically. Uh, we need to continue to support projects and programs that increase increased capacity for passengers and freight. That is to allow us to continue to support model shift and, and making sure that we're, we're getting back on track. Uh, obviously, we made that recommendation before um, the COVID crisis hit. Um, so that there is obviously a significant challenge uh, around kind of capacity and, and uh, pre-COVID, um, that has become less of a problem um, as less people uh, have been using the network. Um, but we are beginning to see a number of pinch points starting to emerge again on the network as freight is now back to uh, over 100, it's now over what it was pre-COVID, so it's, it's greater than um, greater than what it was at, at pre-COVID levels. And passenger numbers are around about, uh, up to around about 70% now. Uh, at a network wide level. And um, we also need to ensure that we kind of have a, a stable and efficient program of, of electrification. We can't afford to kind of um, swamp the, the supply chain with thousands of single track kilometers to deliver on a yearly basis um, right at the end of the program. Because the, the sort of one of the principal key lessons that we learned from the CP5 electrification program is kind of don't have too much going on at the same time and don't expect the supply chain to be able to sort of get you out of a hole when you need sort of lots of electrification delivering in a short space of time. It's absolutely critical that we kind of have a, a stable and efficient program and programs such as those in, in kind of Germany and, and Austria um, and other countries in, in Europe have shown that there's real kind of efficiency drives that can be can be taken from that as well. Oh, that's not the right button. Um, so we used the, the, the recommendations that we made and, and kind of where we allocated the various different technologies on, on, on the network to be able to kind of do some, some high level analysis. Um, so using the decision tree that, that allowed us to work out where, um, where the, the, the three technologies get deployed as we saw on the previous slide. The combination of those two, two parts of the work uh, allowed us effectively to be able to do some, some analysis because we kind of knew what we were deploying where basically and the impact that that had on kind of trains and, and, and the changes in trains basically. Um, so we did some economic modeling um, that modeled five different pathways. Um, uh, it included costs for uh, all, all capital costs for, for electrification, battery and hydrogen, um, as well as capturing um, carbon emissions benefits, uh, journey time improvement, the improvement in performance uh, as we move from, away from diesel and kind of changes to, to the road decongestion and um, passenger revenue. And also included all costs, so not just capital costs, but infrastructure and renewal costs, uh, infrastructure maintenance costs, disruption, 
uh, rolling stock maintenance costs, fuel and lease and uh, network rail wear and tear. Um, and that's what we did as part of the, um, the, the, the document that's published on network rail's website. Um, following that, that document being published, which was uh, called the Interim Programme Business Case, we did some further work with the industry um, in kind of redefining the delivery programme and, and getting an in more into kind of delivery programme to deliver the recommendations that we'd made and kind of basically focusing on how we got to that end state. Um, and as part of that work, we also um, took the opportunity to model a couple of additional pathways um, and we modeled uh, a couple of additional benefits as well. So we added in some air quality benefits um, and we also added in some rail operation uh, cost benefits as well into that further analysis. That document currently isn't publicly available um, and we're working closely with government and uh, uh, DFT and, and HMT to, to kind of make that document publicly available so that we can um, show kind of what that additional work that we've done uh, and how that's kind of impacted the analysis that we have done. Um, so I, I was told as part of the brief for this that, that, that you like graphs. So I've put a slide in especially for you that kind of some provides some nice graphs personally um, that kind of talks around the, the key findings and, and summarizes some of the, the key messages from, from the economic analysis that we did. Um, so you can see the, the initial um, five pathways that we modeled there. Um, so essentially that, that ranged in ambition from kind of low, which we classified as an 80% reduction in traction emissions um, up to a, um, a, a high ambition, which was a, a, a virtually uh, maximum uh, reduction in emissions by 2040. Um, and then we modeled some kind of interim pathways in between those two, two as well. Um, the emissions profiles uh, for uh, those different trajectories can be seen on the top right hand side. So that is tailpipe carbon emissions reductions um, in uh, millions of kilograms per year. Um, so essentially across the different pathways, the purple is the, um, the purple at the top is the least, the lowest ambition pathway and the dark green at the bottom is the highest ambition pathway. Um, you can see it kind of provides an envelope basically to, to kind of show where your emissions reduction will will lie um, or should lie um, if you're kind of going to achieve a, a, a kind of a thing. And as you can see, kind of the different ambitions obviously lead to that, that kind of fan shape where it kind of spreads significantly the further you go into time um, based on kind of the, the level of ambition that you're seeking. Um, the graph in the bottom right um, shows the overall net present values for, for the analysis. So um, from an economic analysis perspective, net present value basically just shows you whether you get a money on a, a kind of return on your investment effectively. So anything over zero means that your benefits are bigger than your costs over the, the sort of appraisal period. Anything under zero means that it costs you more than the benefits that you get out of it, basically. Um, given the kind of uncertainties around capital costs for electrification, we, we modeled kind of a ranged capital cost um, from kind of a high, uh, a low capex to a high capex. What you can see on that graph on the right hand side for the different pathways is that um, the, the kind of business case, as it were, for, for uh, traction decarb as a whole is broadly cost neutral. So the low capital costs for electrification lead you to, to kind of having more benefits than cost. The high capital costs lead you to having more costs than benefits. Um, so overall, the kind of business case is, is kind of broadly cost neutral. Um, interestingly as well, what it does show is that um, pathways that have low ambition, so the 80% the emissions reduction has a lower net present value, but equally, um, the ones that have really high ambition um, also have a lower net present value as well. That's because you're spending an awful lot of money to to get to that uh, to get to that um, end state at a relatively early stage in the program. So that means from a from an economic perspective, kind of spending money sooner is a bad thing. Um, so that kind of leads to the pathways with really high ambition looking quite bad as well. The most optimum uh, economic pathway was the one which had the highest ambition or a 97% emissions reduction, but delivered over the longest period of time. Um, so that was uh, the pathway five was achieved by 2061. Um, 
um, the reason for that is effectively you're spreading your costs over a longer period of time. So from an affordability and, and an economic perspective, it kind of looks better basically. Um, and you can see the shape is replicated on, on the kind of high capital cost ones. The graph on the bottom left is, is a really interesting one, actually, and it, it's, it's, it's always one that frustrates me a little bit, actually, because it's a graph that's in TDNS that's actually a really, really good and really important graph, but nobody ever seems to reference it when they, um, when they talk about TDNS and various different things. Essentially, what, what the graph shows is it shows that the relative whole life costs of each of the three technologies based on the intensity of service. Um, so you can see that for, for where you've kind of got up to about two trains an hour, from a whole life cost perspective, electrification is insanely expensive, basically. Um, so it, it kind of doesn't, doesn't stack up where you kind of have a, a lower level of frequency service. But as soon as you get into the, the higher, higher frequency services, electrification becomes progressively better and better from a whole life cost perspective. Um, and equally, um, rare, so, so this is very much where that kind of on the on the um, decision tree that I talked about earlier on, where I was talking about the relatively high capital costs of electrification mean that kind of infrequent services, um, electrification just doesn't stack up economically. That's kind of the proof that, it, uh, that that's the case really. And that's where you'd prefer to kind of pick hydrogen or battery as a solution for those parts of the network that have kind of half a train an hour or kind of a train an hour basically. Um, by the time you get to two trains an hour, it starts to get a lot more competitive, but certainly for anything that's kind of half a train an hour or, or, or a train an hour, you, you're very much in the kind of um, battery hydrogen sphere as opposed to kind of really focusing on uh, electrification from an economic perspective. So, um, so where are we now and, and kind of what are the next steps for, for traction decarb? So, so the traction decarb network strategy is currently in the process of being refreshed. Um, so that, as I said earlier on, the document was actually finished in October last year. Um, but with the William Shapps plan for rail that, that I mentioned earlier on, um, as well as some updated um, values of carbon uh, and carbon pricing from, from bears that came out in September, um, we're currently in the process of kind of refreshing it basically, just to make sure that it kind of provides the most optimum answer that we can and then kind of covers what we need to, need to cover basically so that it's kind of up to date and, and right basically. Um, uh, and the, the program business case that we're, we're doing basically provides what is in the interim program business case that's on Network Rail's website, um, plus the kind of roadmap of how we get there. So kind of the, the priority of order, the prioritization of kind of delivery and, and how we should go about doing it and kind of the ways that we should explore um, kind of delivering that. I think the, the key thing for us and, and, and where we are as, a, as an organization now is, is kind of very much focused on getting um, the work out of strategy and into delivery. Um, so, so we're transitioning from kind of the, the strategy that we've provided and working very closely with the regional teams, um, the wider government, and, and uh, as I mentioned earlier on, GBR, um, to be able to um, kind of progress um, the plans and, and begin to sort of develop and deliver um, the um, vision program of electrification um, to make sure that we kind of deliver what we need to deliver. Obviously, with the kind of significant challenges and, and pressures that we're facing on, on public finances as a result of COVID-19, that's definitely not going to be easy. Um, the, the recommendations that we've made as part of TDNS are a circa £40 billion investment over the next 30 years. That's an awful lot of money to, to spend. And given the kind of challenges that we're facing, um, it, 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 it is it is it's kind of difficult, really, um, to, to be able to kind of, uh, for, for government to kind of actively be able to commit to such a significant volume of spend. Um, so we're working really closely uh, with government about kind of understanding how we can support and kind of make decisions around those kind of difficult, uh, difficult sort of choices around kind of where, where it's best to invest money and where it's kind of most optimum to, 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 to put cash to, to get the most benefit from a, from a whole economy perspective because cash is kind of a, a, a bit of a scarce resource at the moment. 
I think the key thing around that and, and one of the key focus areas, and, and I mentioned this earlier on when I was talking about the strategic benefits in general, we, we need to make sure that we're kind of bringing scheme forward to have strong business cases. And that means that we need to focus on kind of just, we definitely need to be focusing beyond just decarbonisation. So absolutely decarb is, is really important and, and a critical part of the business case but as you can see there it only makes up about 30 percent of the overall benefits that are contained within the traction decarb network strategy um so for a business case that um it's obviously the, the biggest kind of chunk but for a business case that's focused on on emissions reduction it only makes up around um it only makes up around three tenths of, of the actual benefits that you're getting out of it um, by the time you chuck air quality in, that, that gives you about an extra 10%. So you, you're getting up towards kind of half of the benefits are emissions related. Um, but there is an awful lot of benefit that you get from you know, OPEX cost savings, journey time improvement, and, and what's dubbed the kind of sparks effect, basically. So the fact that you have a greener solution and, and, a, and a more greener kind of um, uh, offering for, for people they kind of see that as a as a as an attractive thing to do and then we'll subsequently kind of move rail as a result of that um as well as kind of a number of other benefits including reliability they, they kind of make up a, a reasonable chunk but I mean sort of 50 percent of the, the benefits are kind of non-emission are non-emissions related um so it's really really important that we kind of focus on that stuff as well um and then we begin to kind of make sure that we're the projects that we're bringing forward, especially at the very early stages, are not just kind of heavily focused on emission reduction, um, mm -hmm. but are also focused very heavily on the, the kind of wider benefits that um, moving away from diesel traction uh, bring from a rail perspective. And so overall, in summary, um, the, the, the key thing there, we need to move today um, to kind of getting people out of cars and, and goods out of HGVs and, and, and getting them onto trains um, to be able to support and, and reduce and, and remove um, emissions um, from the transport sector as a well. whole. Um, we can do that in a number of different ways. Um, certainly the advertising campaigns that have, have been going on recently um, are, are one way of doing that. We also need to make sure that we're kind of incentivizing people and, and logistics companies to use rail um, fares reform is going to be a critical part of that and, and colleagues in GBR are looking very closely at that um, as well as kind of making sure that we're providing things like the, the red growth target that's talked about in the William Capps plan for rail as well as making sure that we're streamlining and incentivizing a uh, modal shift from uh, freight from air to uh, air and road to rail um, and we can incentivize that um, in, in a much kind of clearer and better way and there are a number of my key focus areas that we're focusing on to make sure as well as kind of making sure that we're kind of utilizing the capacity on the network as, as well as we can and, and we've been increasing freight paths um, as a result of kind of the reduced passenger service that's operating and that's allowed us to move a lot more freight around the, the rail network as a whole and that's helped and supported a significant kind of uh, modal shift in itself. We need to make sure from a tomorrow perspective that we're utilizing our assets better, whether that be through hybridization, the use of biofuels, um, or kind of the introduction of diesel electric fire modes, um, especially trains, the new trains that are coming in, uh, a lot of them are kind of built on a modular concept. So as the kind of network changes over time, you can remove the diesel engines from them and put battery banks in. That's a really, really clever way of kind of having something that works today, um, but is also future proof and, and fit for tomorrow. Um, and, and making sure that there's kind of that long term resilience as well. As well as that, they're kind of short, uh, small electrification schemes that would allow a kind of significant transition and change to um, electric traction for, for passenger and freight is going to be key as well. And we need to make sure that we're uh, focusing what limited investment that we do have into the right places so that we're achieving and, and achieving the most optimum emissions reduction that we can. And then finally, the future. We've talked extensively around the, the long-term sustainable program of electrification that we need to have, as well as the introduction of battery and hydrogen trains in order to, to make sure that we're transitioning and moving forward into a, a, a zero carbon future and that we're ultimately ending um, rails contribution to, to greenhouse gases um, as part of the, the kind of future world. 
I hope that's been interesting for you. Um, I, I hope you've you found that interesting and and um, been been insightful. Um, I've seen that there's a, a few questions in the chat, so I'm sure we'll we'll pick those up, and, and I'm sure that um, it'll.